Now, colleagues, um, th thank you, OERs, for chairing the uh, last session. I'd like to uh, welcome to the assembly now Ms. Uh, Saskia Schreiveling, President of the Netherlands Court of Audit. Just a moment. I want to say something nice okay. about you first. <laughs> you have, uh, Ms. Schreiberling, you've held this uh, prestigious post for 15 years. Um, you met me to talk about your work uh, earlier this year in uh, May, I think, when I came to The Hague to uh, find out from the Dutch delegation about the preparations for the session. Um, you also serve on the boards of a large number of cultural organizations in the Netherlands. And on uh, uh, on behalf of the Assembly, I'd like to pay tribute to the Court for its work in pressing for greater financial transparency in NATO. Uh, and also, I'd like to pay tribute to um, Hendrik Jan Ormel uh, and the Netherlands delegation, which was the first to propose that NATO should publish its accounts. They persuaded me that this was important, and it's a cause which I also took up, and I'm delighted but the North Atlantic Council has decided this is what it will do. Uh, but you started the ball rolling, so I congratulate you for that. Um, and I'd invite you to uh, address the assembly. Thank you, Thank you, you so much. Yes, sorry. Well, Mr. Bailey and members of the uh, NATO Parliamentary Assembly, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to thank Mr. Bailey for the invitation to address you, um, which is a great honor for me. And I admire your courage to make time in your agenda these days for the topic of transparency of NATO. In these times of international tension and conflicts, close to the borders of member countries, you may be, would expect emphasis on the contrary. But I do hope to convince you that the timing couldn't be better to make transparency today one of NATO's operational strategies as well. It gives me the opportunity to stress that transparency is a timely issue for NATO and this alliance should not refrain from transparency for reasons of security but should embrace it to become more efficient and effective. For that reason, I will propose you an agenda for transparency for NATO. Part of that agenda is more independence for IBEM, the International Board of Auditors. I will also give you some explanations about the web-based project on NATO's transparency of the Netherlands Court of Audit, the supreme audit institution of this host country of you. I hope that our ideas will inspire you in your work as a member of parliament and prompt you to come up with comments and questions during this session as far as lunchtime gives you time for it. Let me first clarify an important point. NATO should keep its sensitive information confidential. There is no question about that. So our call for transparency must not be understood as a call for disclosing state secrets. On the contrary, the call for transparency explicitly excludes state secrets next to confidential information about private companies and persons. So NATO will have full support from auditors to respect state secrets. No misunderstanding on that point. My suggestions for a transparency agenda, therefore, include better protection of the real state secrets. But in all other information that today still is classified one way or another, but is actually non-sensitive, should be disclosed. Disclosing non-sensitive information is already a long-established practice in many of the member countries, as you as members of your parliaments will be well be aware of. Ministry of Defense in general are transparent about financial management and budgets and do so without revealing confidential information. 
Why is more transparency needed right now for NATO? Besides the everlasting argument of public support, which was stressed by the Prime Minister just only this morning again, it is in these times of new challenges that NATO shouldn't go f should go for efficiency gains, so that less money is needed for fixed costs and more is available for output and support to the missions. Efficiency gains for an organization means keeping your overhead cost as low as possible. And the best way to lower, to lower overhead costs for public organizations is to have a pair of outside eyes ask critical questions about cost. In order to let these outside eyes discuss costs and efficiency, transparent financial information must be available. So, now that our heads of state have promised to increase defense spending in September in Wales, NATO could give a major boost to the internal discussion, uh, internal discussion on efficiency by making the overhead costs of its entities transparent. I'm sure that if the Council took such a decision, everybody in the NATO alliance would start discussing the cost of office buildings, infrastructure, travel costs, stationery, and so on. <clears throat> Discussing overhead costs is not only worthwhile in terms of efficiency. I think we owe it to our service men and women who are doing their job in hostile environments. All troops under the NATO flag must be able to count on the most efficient, efficient business management and support. That means that NATO should do more for less and sharpen up its priorities so that the best resources are available to improve capabilities and missions. Maybe NATO is a very efficient machinery. Maybe not. Me and my colleagues, we cannot give you any guidance on that, because the information needed for an informed opinion is lacking. The second, and maybe even more pressing argument for more transparency in NATO, is to, is to limit the cost of cybersecurity in our rapidly evolving web-based society. Becoming transparent may sound as a liability in our internet world, but in my opinion, NATO can turn it also into an asset. It is a fact that cybersecurity needs more attention now that digital assaults come in all forms and shapes. Bloggers raise critical issues on forums and social media. In social media, and blah, blah, blah. bloggers raise critical issues on, on forums and social media. The media and reporters are at the forefront of criticizing each new defense expenditure. And scientists and hackers have all kinds of techniques to hunt and mine data. It shows that this public scrutiny is increasingly knocking at the door of all public organizations, including NATO. This new form of public scrutiny will not go away. It will become bigger or, if you wish, worse. So it requires new defensive measures, such as better data protection, higher firewalls, and more cybersecurity. Investing in cybersecurity is costly, and measures are often overtaken by events. Having too many facts to protect doesn't help either. The Dutch people have learned that you can't beat a rising tide by building everywhere higher dikes. It is neither visible nor efficient. We have learned that it's better to open up low-lying land and let the water in to give it space. This enables you to concentrate security on parts that are really vital and strengthen the protection of a selected number of data that are really state secrets. I think this Dutch water management strategy can help NATO strengthen its transparency agenda. This would combine data openness with data protection in order to optimize investments in cybersecurity. The transparency agenda should definitely be more than just a Facebook page or a Twitter account. It requires a set of well-defined transparency procedures that serve the specific purpose of improving efficiency and effectiveness. This will enable NATO to sort the wheat from the chaff 
in its archives of unclassified documents and set rules for the automatic disclosure of non-sensitive documents. And by the way, by adapting such a transparency agenda, NATO would be a role model in the international agenda for good governance and long-term goals of the Open Government Partnership. This initiative was launched to provide a platform for governments committed to becoming more open, accountable, and responsive to its citizens. Since 2011, the Open Government Partnership has grown to 65 participating countries, and interesting, 21 of them are NATO member countries. In the Netherlands, the Minister of Defense and of Foreign Affairs have expressed their support for more transparency on NATO expenditure. They have underlined the fact that it will take time and require support from all the member countries. The Dutch MPs also recently asked the Minister of Defense for more detailed information about Dutch financial flows to NATO and the accountability of the different NATO entities to which the Netherlands contributes. And we are very glad that this discussion is now taking place in the Dutch Parliament. And we hope that it will also happen in the other 27 national parliaments of the NATO member countries. It is therefore very important that you as an MP in your country have sufficient information to hold a serious discussion with your Minister of Defense about financial flows to NATO and the public accountability of that money in accordance with your national rules. In your activities at home, you could make use of our, in June this year, launched NATO transparency website. Especially for the international NATO community, we launched the website in the English language. It presents an overview of the public information available on NATO's finances and its results. We have focused on finding information about NATO's common funding and joint funding. And we have del deliberately avoided the complex financial flows relating to missions. It will not come as a surprise that we could not find much public finance through common funding and joint funding um, data. NATO offers some aggregate figures on common funding and leaves the public in the dark, even about the civil budget and the jointly funded entities. There is also no up-to-date organization chart of NATO Alliance. Our website also highlights the backlog in the administrative clo closure of the NATO Security Investment Program, NSIP, NSIP that I want to mention here. Based on IBAN figures dating back to 2011, we have produced this figure. It focuses on the so-called SLICE program, a program that dates back to the period before 1994, 20 years ago, indeed, and represents a financial value of 3.3 billion euros. It shows that NATO has not been able to close 378 projects in the administration. It is a clear case of overdue maintenance, and NATO should come to terms with this skeleton in its cupboard. You will find more if you go to the website of the Court of Audit and then go to NATO Transparency. Uh, and even you have today a chance, we have a booth uh, next to the Ministry of Defense, Serious Gaming, and the booth is, of course, Serious Court of Audit. Maybe if you do your questioning at home, and we keep pushing for our side for transparency of non-sensitive information, we all might be able to follow transparency developments on our website. The disclosure of, for instance, financial data of entities in the civil structure. Hearing this plea for transparency, you may wonder why the Netherlands Court of Audit is so concerned about NATO's transparency. We do not have any specific mandate to audit NATO. We would not be so involved if we would have at NAVO a full-fledged colleague 
with all the characteristics of independence as if it was a supreme audit institution. But IBAN, the International Board of Auditors of NATO, does not have such independence. We are in close contact with IBAN and have stressed in the past the need for opening up the alliance and improving the accountability. Together with other supreme audit institutions, we have pressed for many years to further strengthen IBAN's effectiveness. IBAN works hard to achieve the best, but is seriously constrained by the conditions set by the Council and the member countries under which it has to work. The most recent IBAN annual report covers 12 billion euro, half of which, 6 billion, are expenditures with no unqualified opinion. That's to say that only half of it got a positive opinion of 12 billion euro. This IBAN report proves once again that NATO's financial and management control remains weak. There are several reasons for this, such as the lack of a strong and effective internal audit function in NATO and the lack of a NATO-wide risk management system. This situation means that IBAN can rely to only a very limited degree on the work of internal auditors and has to put in a lot of effort before it can express an opinion. It's high time that IBAN can work according to the international standards of supreme audit institutions. There is, in the meantime, little but a little, hopefully, some light at the end of the tunnel. NATO took this year a first step with the publication of the first three IBAN audit reports on may it be small, three NATO entities, including their financial statements. This is a significant principal improvement, yet it's a small step in relation to the challenges ahead. Positive also is the recent Wales Summit Declaration with a section on transparency and accountability. It feeds my hope NATO will start organizing transparency and accountability in such a way that both are considered assets and not liabilities. And of course, I hope that you will stimulate this discussion and maybe even formulate and adopt a resolution on transparency agenda for NATO. And my third positive signal is that, though I was not here, I hear that Mr. Stoltenberg had a chapter on transparency. And I hope you will push the agenda that I will present now forward in that sense. So to recapitulate, these elements could be part of the transparency agenda, maybe your transparency agenda for NATO. Sharp the distinction between real state secrets and other information. Effective and highly professional investment in cybersecurity only related to state secrets. Open data policy on all other information to begin with the common funding and the joint funding entities, and independence for IBAN comparable to a supreme audit institution. NATO could set itself a challenging time frame by completing this agenda by the inauguration of its new, very transparent headquarters in Brussels, according to NATO's website set for early 2016. Thank you for your attention. Now, Ms. Stuyveling has um, offered to answer questions. Could I have a brief indication from colleagues who wish to ask questions? One, two. I see two colleagues, so I'll take both questions now. If any other colleague wants to uh, uh, ask a question, I ask them to inform the platform uh, as soon as possible. The first question comes from Angeline Isink of the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Mr. President, thank you very much, Hugh Bailey. As you already mentioned, we are really delighted to have Mrs. Stuyveling here today. We are very proud that she is our um, president of the Court of Audit and have been discussing with her these matters for years already and learned a lot, if I may say so, on behalf of the Dutch delegation, very much from her. Um, let's start with saying that looking into the new building of NATO, it's going to be a very transparent building, as we've just seen. So that's a good start. 
Um, Mr. Stavli, coming back to what you just mentioned, you mentioned yourself, maybe NATO is a very efficient machinery, maybe not, your own words. And you also mentioned that you can't give us any guidance on that because the information needed for that, an informed opinion is lacking. Well, that says a lot then. A question could be, and it's, it's, the answer is not going to be easy, I think, for you, but what can we as members of NATO Parliamentary Assembly and as members of NATO of national parliaments actually do more, do better to promote transparency, financial accountability of NATO, and it also might, of course, reflect our own budget, yearly budget discussions on the new year coming. So if you could please reflect on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. If I may, I'll ask uh, all three questioners who have indicated to pose their questions. Secondly, Sir Mingis Campbell from the UK. Uh, it's no exaggeration, uh, Madam President, to say that your remarks, your remarks this morning are music to the ears of the British delegation. Uh, and we, in turn, are obliged to Hugh Bailey, the outgoing president of the Assembly, for, if you like, provoking, prodding, and encouraging us to take up this issue. We have done so to the extent that we have engaged the National Audit Office of the United Kingdom, with which I'm sure you have warm and effective uh, relationships, and perhaps there is some scope between the two organizations for cooperation. I'll leave that with you. But only one question remains in my mind, and it's this. We all accept the division between what's classified and what's non-classified. The question is, who decides what falls into either category? And of course, governments often say, this is an, it is in the national interest not to tell you something when in fact what they mean is it's in the government's interest not to reveal anything lest the government causes embarrassment. In Latin they sometimes say quis custodiet ipsos custodes. Who will decide in your view in a way which will best um, be and most effectively in the interests of our alliance? Thank you. Latin has just become the third official language of the assembly. <laughs> I'm pleased to call one of our real linguists, Mark Angel, from Luxembourg. Thank you. A treasurer, a treasurer of yeah. our assembly. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As a treasurer, transparency, of course, is something very important. And I'm very happy that the Dutch and also the UK delegation, delegation always have put this subject forward. So my question to our speaker would be, um, does, has she presented this agenda for transparency in NATO to her colleagues from other NATO countries or in the EU, when you meet your colleagues from the EU countries? Have you presented that, have you discussed this with them? And do you have allies within the heads of other court of auditors uh, from the NATO nations? Or are you standing rather alone? That's, would, I hope not, so that's why I ask you this question. Thank you very much. Oh, Angeline just says that the Dutch never stand alone, and I agree on that. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the opportunity to answer those questions. No, I'm not alone. Um, all the 27 colleagues of the NATO countries know about my project, our project, and we have seen it as a NATO project. And really, if you take the opportunity to go to our booths, you'll see the website. And the website uh, has information about all the countries as far as we can get on public information. So. We have asked them now, after we have launched this website, to do two particular things. One is on the um, security infrastructure projects, what's, what's the exact name, the NSIP, to go and have their own Ministry of Defense look at the procedures, so not, not look at the project itself, but look at the procedures, why are there still 3.3 billion euros hanging around since 20 years. I mean, that should be, uh, that's the, 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 the cupboard I, uh, I talked about. That's one. And they can do it easily with their powers in their country. The second one is that we will go and follow the Dutch money going to the special entities. And all those entities have different composition of member states. So we'll see if we can, for instance, pick five of those more than 40, follow the Dutch money and see whether we can open that type of entities with the colleagues of the countries that are especially in that uh, entity. 
In the meantime, we try to um, get them to bring us information for the website on the budgets that they have in their own, budget numbers that they have in their own country. They support us, but they are a little bit afraid going into the water. So it would help very much to ask my, to, uh, to answer the, the, the Dutch delegation um, and the UK delegation. It would help very much if you ask in your own country, through your parliament, your own audit office to help the project alive and bring about more pressure on the foreign affairs and defense ministers to bring their data and information and to bring to the NATO uh, level the idea of open government. Because 21 of the 28 members of NATO are also members of the open government uh, partnership. So it, 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 it's ridiculous that you see that they should uh, subscribe the axioma all information is public except state secrets and privacy and company secrets. And they don't bring that axioma to the NATO uh, level. There seems to be two minds in one government, and I think you can only have one mind in one government. On top of that, I think really that cybersecurity is a serious problem, but it's of serious money. And if you want to have an ef efficient NATO on cybersecurity, really around the real state secrets, you cannot go by protecting all the information you have been classifying so far. That is absolutely impossible. It, it means no cybersecurity. It's too much. So if you do an intelligent uh, check on what you really feel is state secrets, then by implication the rest is not. And then you can have an agenda for opening up that information. I think I have covered now the, the, the different questions of the three uh, delegations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms. Driveling, for answering questions so um, clearly and directly. Um, now, I'm going to put the chairman of the International Board of Auditors of NATO on the spot here. He is uh, with us, uh, listening into this discussion. I think at the back, maybe if you could it indicate right at the back, those of you who have an interest in this uh, topic might want to go to this middle door on the right-hand side, meet up with him, and have lunch together. I make that suggestion. Secondly, I understand that an army always marches on its stomach, but the same is absolutely true of a parliamentary assembly. So I want to give you a full hour for lunch on the condition that it's one hour, not one hour and five minutes. That means we'll get back into our plenary session at 2.15 this afternoon. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.